Adelante, Horacio. Can you hear me? Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. As I don't have much time, I'll start right away with the presentation. This is a joint effort by three companies in the group, Silica Network Chile, Silica Network in Argentina, Silica Network in Brazil. And what we are doing is we are conducting a preliminary uh, study of reaching with fiber to the Antarctic continent, the white continent. So it's connecting Antarctica by fiber optic link. I wanted to mention, to, to give an idea of our experience with scientific projects in 2010, we collaborated in uh, the creation of a, a cosmic ray observatory, the Pierre Auger. The Pierre Auger Observatory tries to measure the cost, the high intensity cosmic rays that we, we get to the Earth. These are events that um, there are very few in each si uh, century. So this observatory needs to record all the high energy cosmic rays that we receive. It's in Pampa Marilla, close to Malawi, this in Argentina. And this Muy este, in Chile. Extensa, this is a very extensive area. There are sensors to measure the intensity of the cosmic rays. Actually, these are water tanks, and we measure the incidence as if it were the ballistic of a, a bullet when uh, you're trying to measure the trajectory. In addition, there are some towers that measure the intensity and um, how the cosmic rays get broken down when they enter the atmosphere. This is a diagram of the water tanks. And one of the achievements of the Pierre Auger Observatory is that um, they, 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 they named it as top 10 uh, developers in 2017. To get to the Pierre Auger Observatory, we had to build about 200 kilometers of optical fiber in an area where there were not enough uh, inhabitants, uh, not enough uh, people living to support the fiber and to justify it from the traditional point of view. So, we uh, we got uh, to Pierre Auger, as we had reached uh, to Pierre Auger with the fiber, we uh, took it to Las Lenias, and they have fiber optic thanks to Pierre Auger. In 2009, we uh, signed an alliance with INVAP. We put our pop in uh, INVAP, and uh, we gave them the bandwidth that at the time was very difficult to obtain for them. So. We, this is, uh, that is in Vapen. There you see the radio towers. Our equipment is in uh, the uh, entry pillar. Of in. We also have an alliance with Red Clara, that is um, the network, that is the, corporate, the Latin American Corporation for Advanced Networks. And it's a non-profit international organization that uh, gathers all the scientific networks in the continent. In 2013, actually, not in 2014, we reached ALMA. ALMA is an observatory that has 66 radio telescopes in Atacama, in the north of Chile, where the atmosphere is absolutely clear. And they are about 4,000 uh, meters uh, above sea level. The ALMA project is uh, a project that 
este, los japoneses, los europeos. Um, I was joined by the Japanese, Europeans, and North Americans, and um, they built this uh, 66 high precision uh, antennas that can uh, that permit you to see at the end of the universe. <laughs> so they are all synchronized at the same time, and they focus somewhere in the galaxy that is given uh, this is uh, where the universities compete one of the things that alma managed to do was to take the first picture of a black hole in the universe this is another picture of a black hole in the center of the galaxy and then different views of galaxies many of them are extinguished because they are thousands of kilometers uh, thousands of light years. Then an optic fiber from Calama was laid going through San Pedro de Atacama and reaches where the observatories are located until the amount of data of ALMA was not available every day. This is 0.8 terabytes daily of data, even on cloudy days, because this is a radio telescope. So we had to build 180 kilometers of optic fiber on a terrain that was very difficult at a very high level over the sea. And the Chilean army had laid mines in that area because of potential conflict with Bolivia. So that had to be demined. We also built together with, in association with Provincias Argentinas, what we call the Capricorn Network. This is a network that starts from Sao Paulo, crosses the north of Argentina at the level of the Tropic of Capricorn in order to reach ALMA and then obtain the data produced in the observatory and send these to Europe. Once ALMA is ready, it will reach Antofagasta. And now we have reached the border with the Chaco area. We still have to build the cross at Salta. The conclusion is that there are two types of internet. We have human internet, the one that we are used to using. This is created by humans in cities. The data is created by humans, it is made by humans, and we can access this through search machines such as Google. And Google responds to the needs humans have in the sense of obtaining data, analyzing it, and drawing conclusions. The users of this data are scattered all over the globe, but normally, this is focused in urban centers, but the scientific internet consists in reviewing those things that happen in remote places. ALMA, for example, collects all this information from the stars in a place where there are practically no human beings. So because there are no human beings, this is one of the great advantages that you have so that information can be obtained. So there are places where internet is created and these are the places of observation and this is scientific information and response to different laws for data acquisition. There are a few scientists where this these data come in and many in the back office throughout the planet. Normally they are around the universities. So let us go back to Antarctica. This is a silica network. We incorporated a network that goes from the north of Argentina and using the FOA, which is the southern optic fiber in Chile, we reach Ushuaia on the Argentine side and Puerto Williams on the Chilean side, right down in the tip of South America. These are the submarine uh, cables map. This is a submarine cables map. And there's an empty zone below 33 degrees south. Nobody has laid 
fibers in the south because this is not feasible from the economic standpoint. This is a data center distribution. The same happens here. There are no data centers in the southern part of the world. They're all in the northern part of the world. The temperature distribution, well, the data centers have one third of the consumption of the data centers is energy power to lower the temperature of the servers. The Silica Network is a carrier class platform. It is scalable, it is flexible and robust. There are several Antarctic bases, but all communicate by satellite. There is no optic fiber in Antarctica. So the plan is to lay this from Tierra de Fuego to the Southern Shetland Islands. <laughs> I've run out of bullets. <laughs> so we wish to reach a base located in the King George Island. And this island is famous for the number of bases of different countries in the King George Island. There are bases from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, China, United States, Russia, Germany, Korea, Poland, and the Czech Republic. These are in the island opposite that. So there are bases of 12 different countries. And then there's a landing strip which is a Lieutenant March built by the Chilean Air Force. This is the location of the bases. This is the airport. So the idea we have is to interconnect this with the Isla Grande of Tierra del Fuego with Ushuaia. Ushuaia is connected to Buenos Aires, to Ansata and via Silica Networks Chile to San Sebastián in the Republic of Chile and in Port Williams. The interconnection would be done through the optic fiber of Chile, the FOA, and to have a scientific hub in Antarctica. This is a map of the fibers in the southern part of the continent. In blue, you have the Argentine fiber. In red, that of FOA. And in green, the one we would be building, which would link Ushuaia with Port Williams and then Port Williams with Antarctica. This would be the ideal path. The first step is to link Ushuaia with Port Williams. We are studying this path or also this path from Puerto Almanza, which is opposite Puerto Williams, where the crossing is very short. And the Beagle Canal provides no major difficulties and currents. But then we have to lay the fiber from there to Ushuaia. So we have to conduct bathymetry to understand the seabed of the Beagle Canal and to cover the distance between Port Beagle in Port Williams and Argentina. And we have laid fiber on the Chilean side in Carreras Lake in the south of Patagonia. And we have been quite successful regarding the use of small stretches on the different lakes. Lago Carreras on the Argentine side, it's called Buenos Aires Lake. It is more than 500 meters deep. If you look at the distance from Tierra de Fuego to Antarctica, we 
are only 976 kilometers away on a straight line, whereas Australia is 3,600 kilometers away, New Zealand 2,800 kilometers away, and South Africa is 4,000 kilometers away. So we're the closest point to Antarctica. So the close, the shorter the stretch, the cheaper the construction, and the lesser the number of potential failures. Once we reach the Shetland Island, we would continue looking for bases to the south and the southeast. The inspiration, well, when I was small, I used to read Mexican magazines and I recall Shackleton's expedition. He didn't reach Antarctica. I strongly recommend you to read Shackleton's biography. There's several videos in YouTube regarding Shackleton's experience. He traveled with the endurance, he was trapped in the ice and he could walk all the crew back to that. And in Kennedy's, I recall when Kennedy said we're going to give a name to the moon and because of the end of the decade, and they complied with this. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? And I would like to add information, one of courtesy of HMN. And before, this was called Huawei Marine. This has a new owner, but they maintain this name. And they conducted a bathymetry to reach Antarctica. They specialize in undersea fiber. They have several fibers, and the most interesting one was the FOA that goes from Puerto Montt in Chile to Punta Arenas and Port Williams, and it goes into Caleta Tortel. We built the fiber from Caleta Tortel to Comodoro Rivadavia. So we have another crossing in the continent. And there's quite a lot of experience regarding the construction of the FOA. This is no easy type of construction. Construction in the south will have very strong winds. Very often you cannot continue your work when the wind gets very strong, when wind speed goes from five to greater strength, there you have to interrupt the work with a fiber laying. These are the winds and the waves on the Drake Strait. The Strait of Drake is one of the most difficult straits to cross. This is the landing and King George Island, Island have to go through the south because the north has very steep cliffs. Here they conducted the study and I can present it thanks to their courtesy. And the idea was to build in Puerto Navarino or in Puerto Williams. This is a landing site description for Port Williams. And the marine route has certain problems because the seabed closes the belt of fire of the Pacific. This is volcanic and, uh, seabed and there are undersea volcanoes. This is the geology and one of the considerations of the routes. And the Fiber Home people have quoted the undersea cable, and this would look like this. Okay. In the future, we think that collaboration could make Antarctica a communications hub. 
you will note the distribution of the scientific bases on the continent and you could start on the Argentine side and cross Antarctica and link all the bases. So that is the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions, if any. Thank you, Horacio, for your presentation. I imagine Excelente tu presentación. Excellent presentation. You must have realized this considering the applause. The applause, yes, I have my fans there. You have a lot of fans there. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation and for having gone to Pergamino. Now, let us see if Jaime has any questions in the Q&A. Sí, tenemos tres preguntas por el momento. Este, Andrés. Yes, there are three questions. Andrés Ubauto has two questions specifically for you, Horacio. He says, do you have an, an independent backbone for Red Clara? If that is so, what is the capacity? Uh, could you repeat it, please? I didn't hear you. Pregunta Andrés. Yes, Andrés Ubauto says, do you have an independent backbone for Red Clara? And if so, what is the capacity? La relación nuestra... Well, our relationship with Red Clara is long standing, many years, and part of our, we thrived with them. And the Argentine government has had a relation that is sometimes. Um, uh, sometimes they uh, like Red Clara and sometimes they don't. We have a new capacity. We connect Brazil with Chile. And I don't remember the capacity, but the new one is quite high. Honestly, I don't remember, but it's uh, a very high capacity. Thank you, Horacio. Andres also asks, what are the challenges that you find when deploying fiber optic in uh, um, areas where uh, that have present many challenges? Well, we don't know. We'll see when we do it. It's, it's interesting. The first challenge is that the engine for developing fiber has always been the people living in a certain area and it was uh, promoted by people and large cities. If you look at the fiber optic map, it uh, links uh, places with uh, a lot of people. But here you are uh, going to isolated places to take data to be processed by the universities and the scientific uh, center. So we are taking data of inhospitable uh, places to centers uh, to um, scientific analysis centers, and that's what happened. Good. Uh, last question by Asael Fernandez. It says, good afternoon. That was an interesting presentation. What are the measures that you are considering or will consider to reduce the environmental impact, and especially in such extreme conditions? How long do you think the fiber optic will last? We always uh, calculate that the fiber optic uh, can be paid in 25 years, but actually it's lasted uh, more than 20. So far, nobody has lived enough to find the limit of fiber. The one that we have is more than 20 years old and it hasn't uh, degraded. We don't know how it would behave in an in extremely cold water, but we know. We are reaching inhospitable places such as very high mountains. We crossed uh, the Andes at uh, 3,600 meters above sea level. We don't think that will be a problem. And as to the environmental conditions, we believe that um, 
ours is the most harmless. It's much more invasive to put radio probes and satellite probes than fiber optic. And Gustavo Ferrero finally asked, what are the deadlines that you handle in your project of reaching Antarctica with the fiber? Well, we have established a study, we, we and crossing the Beagle. We want to do this uh, next summer. We, we wanted to do it in the summer, but the pandemic ruined our plans because, for instance, we can't travel and send people to Chile freely because of all the reasons, uh, all the health related reasons. And crossing the Antarctica can only be done in a window of time, uh, close to, almost only in January. We have another question by Esteban. He says, thank you, Horacio, for presenting an inspiring project that uh, encourages us uh, to do our best, uh, dreaming beyond the, the urgencies of each day. What would be the estimated budget for that work? Well, we have calculated it. We're we going to invest uh, $2 million. Then we have to sell capacity to the basis to fund the project. So far, we've had a price that the Chinese have quoted from 60 to 90 million dollars. Our internal budget is 43. It will be a matter of bargaining and uh, it will depend on uh, the needs that uh, the uh, base owners see to communicate. But today, all of the nations use satellite capacity that is incomplete and uh, low capacity. It will all depend on the future analysis.